Good night and welcome to another edition of In Touch. I am your host, Jadia Jopier Emmanuel. Tonight we will be focusing on education. Education has been a passion of the Sinusha Labour Party and you can tell from the experiences under the Labour Party and the achievements of the Sinusha Labour Party in office that education is a priority. Sinusha's first Nobel laureate, Sir Arthur Lewis said, and I quote, the fundamental cure for poverty is not money, but knowledge, end of quote. This has always been at the core of the St. Lucia Labour Party's approach to education. Recognizing the importance of education as a vehicle out of poverty, the SLP administration, led by Honorable Dr. Kenny DeAnthony, immediately sought to and succeeded in expanding education opportunities for all St. Lucians between 1997 and 2006. The shift system was abolished, several new schools were constructed, primary and secondary schools, and more teachers were trained. To ensure that our students were not merely allowed to pass through the system, the National Performance Standards for Primary School students were established. Any student whose performance is below the benchmark level was provided and continued to be provided with remedial assistance. Hunger and poverty prevented some of our children from performing better at school. And so the Senusha Labour Party government expanded the school feeding program in a number of primary schools, developed a book bursary program for primary schools, and introduced a textbook rental program for Forms 1 to 3 at all secondary schools. The government believed then, and still believes now, that education is a basic right and not an elitist endeavor for a select few. Every year, we recall our parents and students would agonize over their fate as they sat the common entrance exam. A bold commitment was made to universal secondary education and that was achieved when every child was guaranteed a place at a secondary school. But that is not all. Education was not simply the academics for the Labour Party. Focus on improvements in the educational system was also expanded to technical skills. The National Skills Development Center was introduced in 2001, and you guessed right, by a St. Lucia Labour Party administration, and our unemployed youth were trained and continue to be trained in technical and vocational areas. Through the NSDC, a number of centers were established around St. Lucia, Monipo, for example, and Choiselle, so that our youth can be trained in various areas. The National Enrichment and Learning Program, popularly called NELP, also provided an avenue for our people, particularly in the rural communities, to be trained in technical and vocational areas. Today, the passion continues the movement continues, investment in the education of our people, both young and old, continue, and that passion is being carried and being led by our Minister for Education, Human Resource Development and Labor, Honorable Dr. Robert Lewis. He is our guest tonight, and Dr. Lewis, I welcome you to In Touch, and thank you for agreeing to be here tonight to speak to us on what has been happening in your ministry and some of the priority areas for the government on the education. Well, thank you very much, Jadia. I'm very pleased to be on your program for the first time in, in touch. Um, I'm pleased to be here to speak about an issue where everybody is, is a stakeholder, that's education. And of course, it's always an area that everybody has something to say about. And I think that's what a democracy is about, that we can allow people to speak. Because when we see what the government is doing, we can speak about our issues because being a citizen means that you should be in a position that you can speak out. But this evening, of course, I'm very pleased to be here to speak about initiatives that the government continues to carry in the field of education. You are an educator and I thank God I did not make the mistake to say you were once an educator, always an educator. What has the journey been like for you so far in the Ministry of Education? Well, I, I really think that at least you get a, a better appreciation of the, the, the hardcore issues in terms of, from the classroom perspective, you, you see what is going on in education as a teacher, whereas as the minister, you begin to see all the various components and you begin to see 
the scope, the, the, the dynamism that is education, because there are so many issues to, to deal with as a small country. And, and one thing I can tell you, having been minister, this is just about three years now, it, it begins to, when I, I do go out to meetings and you begin to realize what we have been able to achieve as a small country in the sphere of education or in the education sector, we, we should be proud of our achievements as a small island developing state compared to some countries that, that have a lot more resources than us and they still looking to see some of the areas we can talk about, for example, universal primary education, universal secondary education, and all the other achievements that we have been able to accomplish, we should be really proud. And I, I think in terms of so what, I'm, what I'm really telling you is, I can see a difference from being a, the minister than when I was just a teacher in the classroom. Of course, the teacher in the classroom, my concentration was on the students that I taught, whom I taught, so that I could ensure that these students were ready to face the world in not just the academic area, but we teachers prepare students to face the world in terms of the, in the effective domain, the attitudes and the values that they take out with them into society. There are a number of projects have been unveiled by the Ministry of Education. And I know that even our listeners, as we speak, can name a few projects or a few initiatives under the Ministry of Education. But for you as Minister, which initiative has brought you the most joy or the most satisfaction um, as Minister for Education? Well, I, I think to begin with, I, I would want to say there are two of them, that, uh, two initiatives that we have introduced as an administration that has brought me the greatest joy. When you are a teacher and you say, that every child has an opportunity to go to school. Yes, everybody may, but sometimes just to get some initial step forward, for example, you can't get to buy some, some books, you can't get to buy some uniform. So the $500 per child that the St. Lucia Labour Party made available to every St. Lucian who entered secondary school and applied for it. I think while the, some persons are Criticize. And again, I think criticism is good, if, especially because there, there, is, there is criticism that is to, to be destructive, but there is criticism which is constructive. I think just having $500 for some parents, just to see the, the smile on the faces of those persons who say, at least I'm able to buy some things to begin my child's education at the secondary level, I think that has pleased me tremendously. And the second one is the one laptop per child. While there are issues we're going to discuss in a while sure. about the one laptop per child, I think this is a wonderful um, program because in the, in the 21st century that we're in, the tools of the 21st century are, are, the, are the gadgets that the students ought to be using, the laptop, the tablets, the smartphones. These things are indispensable in this age. We, we, we can't, as educators, we can no longer think that these things are luxuries. They're just the necessary tools that students need. So I, I think these two to begin with, and I'm talking about just what we're talking about just for students. We're not talking yes. about other infrastructure just yet, but just these, these two, I think, speaks volumes about the, the, the social conscience that the St. Michelle Party has, because it, it recognizes that if you want to bring your people up to the 21st century, you must, you must begin to give them the necessary tools that they need. I think even the critics of this program would recognize the impact of, of these two programs. In fact, just tonight, I was watching the evening news on, on DBS and the street vibes. There was a student in his Arthur Lewis um, uniform saying that as students, we need laptops. We need tools so that we can undertake our study in a less stressful environment so that we can have access to information just as everybody else and so given that the program was introduced i'm sure that there are demands from other forms as well from other schools where our students are asking for access to to these devices but to speak to the one laptop per child program i know that the ministry of education did undertake uh, an assessment of the program what did it reveal are we satisfied with the impact of the program are there um, issues within the program that would concern you as Minister for Education that we need to work on um, and is it serving the intended purpose? Well, first of all, I must say, I must give credit to Mr. Jumina Anthony, who is the one who carried out that study. And I'm quite impressed with the, his ability to, within, less, with, within um, a year of the program's implementation, 
he was able to collect data that would speak from the position of the parents, the students, and the teachers and principals about how, what are some of the issues involved. I think by and large, what the research told us is that the parents and students are very pleased with having a laptop. The biggest issue for, for the users of the laptop, the students and the parents, and even the teachers, would have been the idea of um, broadband, the, the ability to access the internet, which is one of the things that we need to do and we're doing yes. to ensure that all of our schools have adequate access. Because while, for me, a laptop is very significant, especially for wood processing, for me, especially with preparation for SBEs in schools, but it is not the ultimate, the only use you can put it into. Students want to know that they can access the world wide net because, because what they really want is they, they want to access information. Information is the new capital. That's what people want. And I think the biggest two things came out of that research, I should say. One, the, the lack of broadband um, in, in our schools. And the second one was, if you're going to introduce laptops, clearly the teacher preparation must be first and foremost because our teachers ought to be okua with the tools that their students are using. And I think it is, it, it, it is one of the criticism that, that of the program that I would take and because we, we were aware that that was going to be an issue because many of our teachers are not all together at that cutting edge of the technology. But I think that we can handle with time. And I, and I want to tell teachers I'm very pleased that teachers uh, have spoken about what are some of the issues. I know Mr. Anthony who has been given that responsibility for the ministry to work with teachers. Some teachers have been get, got more training and we're looking for more funding to make sure more of our teachers get training in ICT. Are the laptops being utilized to your satisfaction? Yes, the laptops were handed out from last year to our students in, in Form 4, but um, you have noted a limitation and that is um, our teacher training. Whereas some teachers are trained and some teachers are able to utilize the laptop, there is a limitation in some cases. Has that hindered the use of the laptop or do we have students making full use of the laptops despite some of the limitations such as broadband and so on? Is it incorporated into the, the, the classroom setting or are they being given assignments where they would be using that laptop for the purpose it was intended? I, th I think what you have to say is I'm almost certain, and I can take it because I have a daughter who is in Form 5 now, and she uses that laptop extensively mm -hmm. to carry out her school assignments. Um, I mean, yes, the, 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 the access to the internet is an issue, but I, I think when we are going to see the full impact, impact of that laptop is when we are able to get the laptop into the into the school infrastructure being used in the school to be fair when teachers are going to be able to use it a little more in their presentations mm -hmm. we are going to see the full impact i am i am and i'm not too worried about it now I, i'm not saying it is not necess necessary it's a, new program. it's a new program but we have to begin to say that at least we're moving in the right direction we could be sitting there crying about at least the first thing we want to know is do you have you do you have students who have a use of a laptop because right now teachers have not been adequately trained in that regard i'll be quite fair and I, I and i must tell you but i think the laptop is meeting its need because as i said most of the 30 plus subjects that cxc offers has an sba component there are only two subjects that i can think without an sba component at the moment well maybe three I'm not too sure, but it's English A, English B, and mathematics. Ah. These do not have. But and, even and then, Dr. students Jules could use. said that they would be introducing a mathematics SB. So, well, I, I have no doubts that When CXC he said so, I said, thank God, I've passed that CXC stage. CXC will be introducing. But <laughs> quite honestly, an, S, an SB in mathematics is really going to benefit our students. Because right. mathematics, not everything that you teach in school can be assessed on a text, pencil and paper exam. There are lots of things you'd want students to be able to give you knowledge of. For example, the whole idea of measurement. Here is something that we teach in school very often, but people do not have a sense of 
grasping the concept of measurement. If you ask some people how much something weighs, whether it is in pounds or in ounces or in kilograms or in grams, this, they have a difficulty with it. But as an SBA comes and where people have to be more practical, people are going to get involved. Because some people can tell you they've walked this morning, but they cannot tell you how far they probably have walked. Yes. Uh, I, I think you just exposed one of my weaknesses there, Minister. And I also noticed that you switch your cap from Minister for Education oh. to the mathematician and, oh, the, well. and the educator. Yes. But um, the issue of the laptops and the report, did the report make any mention of possible misuse of the laptop? Um, because there have been some concerns from members yeah. of the public that whereas the laptops were presented and we did speak to um, you know, certain guidelines for the use of the laptops and you know, things that would protect our children from misuse of the laptops, there are some concerns in some areas. There are concerns. One of them, they're good and bad concerns. I, I think one of them, a lot of the laptops that people were saying, because when we first um, worked with the Trinidadian government on this project, mm -hmm. one of the things that Trinidad did was to take off social media, like Facebook, yes. of the laptop. And some of our students are very creative. They find ways of putting it on. That's a genius Now, that them. tells you that our students are doing some things. I, I, I think that sometimes some of the students give the laptops to other persons yes. who find other things to do. But these are in the minority, quite honestly. Um, I think the majority of our students were able to use the laptops for the purposes that were they were intended. And I say to people at all times, a car is a wonderful um, um, equip piece of equipment, but a car can be used for destructive purposes. Anything can be used. So while we can say that there are, it's a minority of students who found certain things to do. But some of the things, even the, even the Facebook, social media, which students were not supposed to go on, like YouTube. And I, and I think that we should change that policy. I think we really want our students to use the YouTube. But responsibly. To, to use, to, because there's a lot of information, a lot of information on YouTube. Sometimes you want to learn, let's say, bearings. Uh, you have to use mathematics yes, again. Yes, yes, yes. Or any yes. topic for that matter. And you can get a demonstration lesson yes. on that. I think another issue, maybe just to go back a bit, content. We need to be sure that there, there's enough content on the laptop that our students can use. Because I don't think in the first year we had enough content. So the ministry has begun addressing these issues in many ways. And I hope we can continue as we get the various criticisms, as we continue to look at research, what our students are saying, what our parents are saying, we can tweak the, the program to, to achieve the things that we want to achieve. Last year, the laptops were distributed in the first term, yes. in October. And so since then, I've been bombarded with messages and questions from our students when are we getting our laptops? In fact, there have been rumors that the program has suspended um, and that the government is currently reviewing the program and so our students this year would not be receiving laptops. Is there any truth to that? All right, well, I need to say we, we do apologize for the lateness in distributing laptops this year. One of the things the ministry did after the, the first year with that same review was to have a, try, have a policy change. And that was taken to cabinet and the cabinet agreed. What the ministry is saying is that because we give the laptops in Form 4, students would have had access or use of the laptops in schools for two years. But the ministry is saying, why don't we get to them in Form 3? Because then they can use it for three years and then be out of school. So what the ministry did is to adopt that policy as the cabinet of ministers uh, um, agreed to, to it. And then what we had to do, because last year we only procured about 3,500 laptops, this year for us to take care of the Form 3s and the Form 4s, we've had to procure about approximately, and the teachers get also, approximately 7,000 laptops. And what we're doing is we're getting these laptops from Venezuela. These laptops, the first batch of laptops will be here next month, December, and the second batch will be here by January. So that means we should be able, and in my, in my opinion, we, we will, and that is what I think as a minister what we will do, we will be able to give the, f the, the first batch to the Form 4s because our Form 4s really ought to be using the laptops already. And of course, the second batch, our Form 3s, should be uh, 
be accommodated. And I think what, what we're doing is, so by next year, we'll only have the current group who in Form 2 would move to Form 3 to service. So we didn't want to disadvantage anybody. So we're given two groups this year. So after this year, we're strictly going to be at Form 3. So by the second term of this school year, our students By January, should we should have, everybody should have the laptops if everything goes up to plan because, in fact, PM and I discussed the very issue just before I arrived there. He actually got um, a sample of the laptops that we are getting this year to make sure that we, 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 were, in, we were happy with what we're having. And of course, to make sure that it's not in Spanish because it, it's, oh, it's coming from... Well, yes, well, we've had the technical people at the ministry Excellent. look into the operating <laughs> system. I can't talk about <laughs> the operating system, but right, I right. think from what they've told me, the operating system is just a bit different, but it, it, it's still... It, it, it's still a laptop that we're getting this year and, and and incidentally i shouldn't say incidentally i should say that while the ministry was thinking about the tablets majority of principals in school said they would prefer us to stick with a laptop and we can think of a thousand reasons why we do for a commercial break now when we come back we will speak to the improvement at our school plans it has been a problem i think week after week we heard the principals of some of the schools complaining Parents were complaining, students were complaining. A significant sum has been set aside to invest in our school plan. So when we come back, the Minister for Education will update us on these projects. Welcome back to In Touch. My guest tonight is Honorable Dr. Robert Lewis, Minister for Education, Human Resource Development and Labor. Dr. Lewis, I want to focus a little bit on the infrastructure side of education. I know that a decision was taken by the government of St. Lucia so that we can have all of our infrastructure work handled by one ministry. But in terms of education, your ministry would be the lead ministry being responsible for a safe school environment, being responsible for an environment that, that of course, is welcoming to learning. The Miko Infant School was one of the troubled areas. I recall very early into your tenure as Minister for Education, questions were being raised, parents were agitating, parliamentary representative was agitating, saying that the conditions at the Miko Infant School was unacceptable. That has been addressed, and you now have a, a new school at the, at the Miku um, village, and it is now incorporated, so you have a combined school. There are issues in other places, but I was so pleased when I saw a few reports coming out of the Ministry of Education that we will be undertaking a lot. That is a huge investment in our school plans. And so I want to start with one of the troubling areas, and that is the shift system that currently exists at the current um, secondary school. Many parents have been complaining about the time, you know, that their children are coming home from school. I know, too, that there were some health conditions. I saw that a sword turning ceremony took place. What will be happening at the current secondary school? How long will it take to have the construction of that new wing? And before I answer your question, the specific question, I just sure. need to say, on an annual basis, the government of St. Lucia spends anywhere between 2 to $5 million repairing the school plant. And anybody who'd, who has a house, just any small house, would appreciate the wear and tear, and especially schools where children go in and, and so on. You could imagine and our school plant, of course, in this country is becoming of age. We're a small country, but our school plant is becoming of age. And therefore, there is need to do a lot of work in a lot of schools. But I must also tell you that in the, in the last arrangements of the Ministry of Education, a lot of money was spent in the school plant, but some of that money never got to the work it should have done. So I, I need to make that clear. And, and that's why the, you notice that the ministry, the, under this government, there is one Ministry of Infrastructure which handles all government's stuff. Now, I, I need to say, you talked about, and I thought you were going to say, as you said, in my early in my tenure, I thought it's my tenure as a parliamentarian. From day one, I arrived in the House of Assembly, and I began talking about the dilapidated condition of the Miku Infant School. Yes, yes, and that was under the United Workers Party government, and nothing was done about it. 
And no sooner that the Sindhu Shalaya Party got into government, we kept to something that I was on to, because the former parliamentary rep, Ms. Mrs. Janine Compton Antoine, was very keen about it also. And I supported her on this issue as an educator. And we made sure that we, we, we did an extension of some $2.6 million to the Miku Primary School and made these schools once. So the, the Miku Infant School was moved to the primary school. Um, there has been a program that the government of St. Lucia initiated in 2009, and that is the Basic Education Enhancement Program, which is called the BEEP program. What that program does is that it had two components. It has two components. One, a quality component where you had to try to, where the government tried to provide training and, uh, and certain professional development programs for teachers, principals in strengthening the system and developing capacity. And that, that, pro, that, that two components really, the training of teachers as well as the procurement of equipment. And obviously procurement of equipment, furniture for schools, um, yeah, utensils for labs, and these things are ongoing because that program will last until the next year. Then that program had a second component, which is a building works component. And what the government had done was to carry out a condition survey. And the condition survey told them at the time and doesn't mean they were not all the schools, but there were 12 schools that needed urgent, urgent repairs being done to them. And these 12 schools, the first four, having been completed, the first four are Denny Riviere Combined, Salt Bus Combined, Deriso Combined, and the Denry Primary School. These four, each of them at a cost of about $1 million, they have been refurbished. Were, were these schools refurbished while you were Minister for Education or did we inherit? They, we inherited them, so, but essentially within our tenure, they were done while they began okay. before, but these schools really came, the program really came on within my tenure as Minister because most of them, were all four of them, were completed last year. Okay. And, and these four schools I just spoke about, they were done under the BIP program. Then you have another additional eight schools. And what we did this past week, last week, um, beginning week November 17th, or if you say 16th, which is Sunday, yeah. we had sort of ceremonies. On Tuesday, November 17th, or is it November 18th, we went to Fawasaw. And the Fawasaw school, having been established in 1968, you could have seen that the Fawasaw school needed a facelift. In fact, the block that had first been built in 1968, and incidentally, was, was opened by the Honorable Hunter J. Fassois, who whose funeral is tomorrow, mm -hmm. a former Minister for Education. And that block, there, there's going to be a new block with classrooms, and, and the school should have a brand new block, and to get rid of the old block, which is some 30, 34 years or 36 years old. In fact, not 36, 46 years, because it was about 1968. Then you have, we had a sort of ceremony also at the Viewfort Infant School, a yes. school that needs work to be done. And I should say the school at, at, at Fawasson is about $3.2 million has been spent by the government for, for works on that school. Then you have Viewfort, where some $1.2 million has been spent to do renovations because there's a lot of work to be done in that infant school, especially the interior of the school, yes. as well as the... And, and the steel frame has, has yes. corroded. Anybody who, who knows the Viewfort Infant School would know how badly it looks now on, in, inside. And I'm very happy because we had to remove, we had to move the children of the infant school to the primary school yes. for these works to go on. Then we have two other schools, the Clennon Mason Memorial, where some six million dollars has been used to do a, a three-story block that will replace two of the blocks that we presently have and these blocks are again over 45 years old and the one you mentioned about with the shift system is yes, yes, Corinth. the Corinth secondary school at Corinth you had the plan was always to build a, a new block that would have classrooms and would also have facilities for guidance counseling all these various um, uh, amenities that teachers are expected to work in. But what you find out, eventually, at the same time, one of the blocks that was not even down for repairs, that came down and we found out it was infested with mold uh, and termites. And the government of St. Lucia had to 
um, to tear down this block. And now you're going to have also additional work happening on that school. And therefore, the reason why they're on a the shift system is because you don't have enough space. You don't have enough classroom space for the size of the school. Because right now, with one block that the government, when they did the condition survey, had not anticipated would have come down with mold and termites. And these are not things you can always see. You can't always blame people for that. These things do happen. And I, and I, I, I must say, I'm very pleased with the parents, the way they've handled themselves, and the teachers and students in having to go on the shift system. So I want to commend the parents of the children of the current school for the manner in which that they have they have been patient, waiting for that block, but more so now that they have to be on a shift system, they are working along with the teachers to ensure that the students get the quality education that we expect. Um, well, the good thing I'm happy for Corinth, and I'm sure Mr. Andrew said it at the Sultan ceremony, that they've waited so long that they're even getting a bonus. They're getting a covered facility where they can have a covered space over the net basketball court. I can imagine and that what the principal at the Viewford Comprehensive School is saying right now. Because <laughs> from the time I was a student yes. there, we have been speaking about our auditorium. Right. And so I'm sure the people at Viewford Comprehensive would love to hear that there is some bonus somewhere. I am sure. I am <laughs> sure that there. I, am, I didn't mean to put you on the spot no, like that, but this I, is my I, school. I agree. I yes. Agree. I so when I hear sure. bonuses, I am thinking that it needs to, you know, go down to the south a little bit. Of course. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure that with a little, with a little whispering in the air. Of the minister for finance. The minister for education and of finance. <laughs> There will be. No, but um, we, we heard that for true yes. during the graduation. And I agree. Viewfort, what we call Viewfort Comprehensive Larry Shoes. Shoes. Yeah. It, it's a huge school in the sense that it, it also has it's the only secondary school in this country with sixth form. And therefore, a special school. there a is a school. need, yes. There is a need for us to begin to think about an auditorium for yeah. Viewfort. I, I must tell you that while we're talking about this, there's a lot of changes in view for this past year. Yes, and the I to The changes now to that, that you've had the disestablishment of the view for technical school, mm -hmm. and you've also had the disestablishment of what you used to call view for campus A, yes. view for campus B, yes. because what you have now is a brand new secondary school housed in refurbished. The view, old view for view technical, technical school, yes. now called the Viewfort Comprehensive School, Binfield, and it should get its brand new name very soon, and that's one of the things that we're working on now. Yes. And Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School, Larishus, which used to be called Campus B, now takes in form ones, two, three, four, five, right. and, and six. six. So that means yes. students, when they go to any one of these schools, they go through a five-year period or six-year period yes. as as any baby but I, I must tell you I, I think that is a good news because you we also took out the post-sec program out of the camp what you used to call campus B that's Larry mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and the campus A with the where campus A was housed we now have we're hoping Sir Arthur we're giving we're hoping to give that to Sir Arthur Lewis because I believe Sir Arthur needs to have facilities in the south of the island where students can that you can expand Sir Arthur in the south and the students will not have to make their way all the way to Castries yes. to access a secondary, um, a tertiary education. Of course, it will be left for students who want to come, but at yes. least we're giving the opportunity for students to stay in Viewfort or stay in the south to access tertiary education. Because so we, we have been disadvantaged in that regard. There are only business and secretarial yes. um, studies available currently in Viewfort. And so if you want to venture into the auto mechanics and the information technology and so on, you would have to come up to Castries. And so the decentralization of the courses and the programs offered by the San Luis Community College, of course, would be welcome news to the people of Viewfort. Um, Minister, I want to go back to the current yes. issue just before we move along in our discussion. Um, we spoke about the shift system yes. and we also spoke about what is going to happen to remedy that system. Right. Do we have a proposed time frame for the yes. construction of that new wing? Yes. Um, by, by, by what the engineers and Mr. Pierre likes to say that. I'm not an engineer, but the engineers have told us that the schools, that, that these, all four of the schools that I said that are presently being, whether expanded or Very refurbished, cool. all of them should be ready by November next year. 
that means all works should be completed and the school in fact we expect we expect Corinth to get out of the shift system soon after the new academic year 2015-2016 begins. There was a view that given the situation that existed at Corinth that um, the Ministry of Education should have taken a position not to admit any first form students into the current secondary school this year so that the school can operate as per the normal hours. Did the school have the capacity to um, to operate with forms two to five on without a shift system? I, I think that, to be honest with you, I think that might have been uh, a suggestion. But but the next thing is sometimes it might be better to have your full fledged form ones, and you go uh, you go with the inconvenience of a shift system, but you know that you're going to have form twos within a year because what it means that you you're now going to build the school expand the school and the school is going to be out of a particular form and sometimes this doesn't always work for the smooth running of the school because sometimes when you're missing when you're missing that link you're missing a particular year it's not always the best i think quite honestly i, I again i want to commend the teachers i don't think the teachers the teachers um ever i don't think the teachers ever were the ones who moved that um, that position because they were always, always happy. They said even if they had to move to new location or they had to go on a shift system, the teachers were very contented at least. I, I mean, there are circumstances for them that, that they would prefer to have had their school, everybody at school. And I can tell you, one of the issues, the ministry was looking to move Corinth to the old um, girls' vocational site, which St. Jesus Convent did sometime in 2009-2010 where Form 1s were housed there. But what the school essentially was saying is they prefer to have everybody on one compound mm -hmm. even if they had to go for a shift system. So yes, there were a number of scenarios but I think at the end, I think generally from my understanding in my discussions and our discussions with the staff principal, they pr they'd prefer staying in one place on the shift system because they realized that they just didn't have adequate classroom space because the classroom space unit is when you break up these groups into smaller groups for teaching not not just to house students in one room because in the secondary school there's a lot of movement as you yes 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 you've been to secondary you'd have school. to go to the computer yes. lab and then you have a class in this block and, right. and and so on i know that once you begin to unveil projects and you begin to name schools that are being attended to that the other schools where the conditions are, are not the best we know that um, while we have a number of new secondary schools um, which were built during the Labour Party's administration previously, our primary schools have not gotten that level of attention. And so I'm sure that there are other schools um, where the principals have been clamoring for that kind of investment. What can we see or have, the, have you identified some of the key areas or priority areas where we'll move to do some work um, in the near future? Well, under the same big project, there are still three schools I have, I have not, we've not even, we don't, in fact, because the project was dragged so much. Mm -hmm. Here you have Lage Combined School. That school should have been totally rebuilt because of course you're hearing the problems that the school has, yes, yes. even after it has been moved to a new location. That school should have been rebuilt for some $6.5 million. And we, we were not able to do it because the monies are just not there out of the loan that was first taken from the CDB because the CDB is giving 86% of that money for the beef food out of $37.7 million. And the government of St. Lucia is meeting 14% okay. of that. Lage cannot be built immediately. The Gordon and Walcott Memorial yes. Schools I, were also on that program. The parliamentary representative asked about this school. When I sent Which, out a note who's that? on the Stevenson King, Oh. When, when I sent out a note about, um, well, the Prime Minister's Baskashu school Central. in Viewfort South, he asked me what about oh, his school. Central. Well, I don't know. Well, I we'll have Kashu. to have a discussion with him Kashu. about the boundaries. That's Kashu. And, no, and he knows. I think that's Castro Central because my, um, Gordon Walcott will be in the Castro Central constituency. But maybe he has a special arrangement oh, but with Oliver He was Frederick. asking about Vidbute. Ah, because, okay. sorry, there's one more school. He was asking about Vidbute because Vidbute is also, Vidbute combined, is also one of the schools on that project. I think what the government has to do, quite honestly, and the ministry has begun discussing it, is to have an ad loan 
you'll have to go back to the CDB to take additional funds to finish the schools. And, and it's not, these are not the only schools. Yes. We have to build, the general infant school has to be rebuilt. Now, there are already plans are already in the way. I think a contract should be given to somebody sometime this month for the school. That school should be built somewhere between the Denry Primary and the Denry Police Station. A new Denry Infant School at a cost of $6.5 million. The Delce Combined School. That's another school that is in bad shape. And, and I'm, I'm considering tonight and tell you a number of schools that are not necessarily at the, the, the state where you'd want it to be. But the point is, we can only do them one or time. two yeah. or three at a time because it takes resources to do this. And, and that's why you must appreciate what teachers do, the conditions they have to work under on a daily basis. And anybody who wants to go into schools and give teachers trouble when teachers have to really teach in certain conditions because it's not because the people of St. Lucia do not want to put monies into the refurbishing of the schools. I think the issue for us is, do you have the resources at the moment to do all the schools that are needed? And, and I just want to linger a little long by saying, most St. Lucians will be aware that a lot of schools, a lot of the schools we have, were built sometime in the 1950s, 1960s. Yes. Way before and I was so born. They're just yes. starting to not just patchwork, you need to serious overhaul and there is going to be a need for the government of St. Lucia to spend some monies in that regard. Just before we go to a commercial break, there's a question I must ask you about our schools. Um, I know that in the past, the St. Lucia Labour Party's position has been to expand, to build new schools, particularly secondary schools, because this is where we had the limitations. Students were being denied entry because of the lack of space. Now that we have addressed the secondary school education, the Prime Minister revealed very recently in the House of Assembly that our birth rate is dropping. If you were to do a review of our education system too, you would realize that our teacher to student ratio is among the best in the world. Have we given any consideration, given the, sh the, the cost, the expenses we have to borrow to build these schools, and in some cases, we are borrowing to accommodate a small number of students within small communities. Are we at the point where we must take stock, where we must review what we have and make a determination as to whether it is more cost effective to rebuild or to shut down and combine some of our schools? Well, just to answer your question, because I think you say we have a, we have a break coming up. Just to answer that question, you see the ministry begin to, we are amalgamated the, okay. the Miku Infant and Primary. And it's a plan in my head and in the ministry, I'm the, and I'm looking at it seriously, that there, most of our, sometimes a lot of our primary schools can be as many as 102 students, 98 students. There are some schools that are so small that you want, and you have an infant and a primary, and the best thing, I can name about four of them for you. Yes. Another school where you see, we're just going to spend about $750,000 on the Canaries Infant I School. I to ask you about that. That school, the works should start sometime next month where we're going to at least get the school ready for the new academic year. But 750000 is going to be spent on that school to take care of damages done to the school during the Christmas Eve trough 2013. Now, you're right. That's a school that should be looked at in terms of whether you want to bring the infant and the primary school together for a combined population of just about 200. The ancillary infant and primary is another combo you might want to look at. The millet infant and primary is another combo. There are so many of them in the country. There are schools which we cannot, even if, for example, you might tell me that um, I think Debara is um, what you call a multi-grade school. It might just have about 30 students. But there is a reason why some schools have to be kept alive yes. because they serve a purpose where they are. Bhutto now is a school that attracts students from other areas outside of Bhutto. Mm -hmm. But it is a very important school because of where it is. So I, I know when we're doing that, we have to be very careful how we rationalize it. The ministry mustn't just do things. There are people whose lives we are affecting. And sometimes trying to always think about the numbers and not the 
the most crucial factor in the equation. It might be about accessibility. And, and therefore, you're right. We, we have, the ministry has begun the process where to look into see how can you max to, to get better efficiency because the resources are tight. How can we do that in the, the atmosphere that, in which we live? Understood. We'll go to a commercial break. When we come back, we'll be taking your calls for our Minister for Education, Human Resource Development and Labour. Stay in touch. We'll be right back. Welcome back to In Touch with me, J.D. Ejope Emanuel. My guest tonight is our Minister for Education, Human Resource Development and Labor, Honorable Dr. Robert Lewis. While he has his other portfolios and responsibilities, we have been focusing on education tonight because there is a lot happening there and we felt that you needed to be informed. I know too that it pains him that he has been on the program and has not spoken about his constituency, Castries right. South. And so I will make an apology for him even before because we may not have time to get into all of what is happening in his constituency. Our phone lines are open for 527347. Good night and thank you for calling in touch. Hello, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, JD. Good night, um, Dr. Lewis. Good night. I am um, enjoying the program Thank for you. obvious reasons. Can if you can take the voice. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So this is a teacher, I believe. Mean. Okay. Yes, a teacher. Okay. What I, Dr. Lewis, what you did not mention yes. is that the dismissment never before, I've been a teacher for over 25 years, and never before have I ever received a dime. And for two consecutive years, the government has provided teachers with bursaries in the amount of $700 to purchase materials for the classroom. Yes. I don't know if you're aware of that. <laughs> As Minister, I'm sure well, he's aware. Yeah, well, I, 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 one thing I can tell you, thank you, Carla. Uh, yes, I am I'm quite aware of it. I, I must tell you that the Prime Minister was the Minister of Finance and another seven or more of his cabinet members were teachers. Yes. And one of the things we realize is teachers spend a lot of their money in buying things for students. And rightly so. Teachers have always done so. And the, the, the least we could have done in, in an environment where things are very difficult for teachers was to give them that teacher material assistance, whatever you may call it. But the point is, we realize it is not going to, it's not a big amount, but I think our teachers are grateful for, for it. And I, and I okay. must say, I was very pleased. Well, I, I am very thankful, and I yes. think I echo the sentiment of many teachers. Another question. Sure. How many schools, when you became minister within the last three years, and as you follow the trend from the time when Mario Michel was minister of education, how yes. many schools did you meet, and how many schools since then have been built? Under this administration. Okay. Thank Just you for, for the record. That call. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much. Well, let's put it this way: since Mr. Michel, Mr. Michel started the education revolution towards universal secondary education, yes. universal secondary education, and I must say, we give credit to all governments of Saint Lucia who have who have allowed us to achieve universal primary education. By the time I became minister, Mr. Michel had taken the school plant, especially the secondary school plant from about maybe about eight, something away between 18 to 22 and 23. So really because of full access, I have, I have not had the need to concentrate on building any new school mm -hmm. because Mr. Michel had done while he was minister together with Dr. Jules as permanent secretary, had already done all what was needed to bring us to universal secondary education. Actually, we have a lot of space now in our secondary schools and some of that space we are thinking we might have to use it for early childhood education so to refurbish it to reorganize it but i, I think your question is to say uh, the answer to your question sorry i should say is there was never a need for me to have to build any new school what what i need to do as minister is to see how we can enhance the school plan because i made the point earlier there is a need now for our teachers to get some better facilities within which to work and it's simply a matter of time where the government of St. Lucia will ensure that almost all of our schools will be up to that level. Sure. Good night. Thank you for staying in touch. Hello. Hello. Good night. Hello. Good night to you. Good evening. It's a very interesting program. Um, 
Good night to you, Minister and Mrs. Mrs. Pierre. Good night. What I'd like to say is that um, I think that you're doing a very good job, but I'd really like to see more emphasis on special needs children um, who are physically challenged, also visually challenged. And there's one person I think we need to, not one, but we need to also recognize um, what the Tenusha Blind Welfare is doing. Additionally, um, Ms. Jessica Jacobri, who is um, visually impaired, she is a teacher aide to a number of students who are visually impaired. So I think we really have to pay hats off to her. She did graduate from UWI, and yes. then I think sometimes um, the business spaces need to be a little more sensitive um, to persons who are differently able. So yeah. basically, that's my contribution tonight. Thank you so much, Carla. And yes, I, I agree that our business places, both public and private sector, need to embrace a little bit more. But uh, just Special to give the, 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 public, the private sector, I think they, they, they're very sensitive because you see Ms. Jacobi, she was incorporated into that, into the whole idea of a, a, a open society. I also want to tell the caller that there has been a lot of movement, and I must tell you, there have been a lot of movement, the same Mario Michel with the Education Revolution, to send teachers for training. Right now, we have in almost all of our schools teachers who are trained with special education. Of course, we need to do more. Even in the main, mainstream education Mainstream sector? education, in oh. primary schools. Most of the primary schools, if not all, would have at least one teacher who has been specifically trained. Because the government of St. Lucia went for a program with Lynchburg College where it sent teachers for training. In fact, even the program where we put a council in every secondary school because we recognize there would be a need for that. But I, I must tell Akwala, yes, I've been very sensitive towards special education because I think, I mean, I'll be honest, let me give Dale um, Elliot. He, he's raised the consciousness of St. Lucians in a lot of issues like autism and so on. Yes. And, and, and these issues had not been lost on the St. Lucia Party administration between 1997 and 2006 where you saw the move to incorporate some of these children. And, and I will tell you, like, for example, next week, Wednesday, I'm going to a special program for children with special needs, and we want to say thank Digicel for making the last three years, this, they have been the ones who have sponsored that particular program for our special needs children, where they have fun, they enjoy themselves. Yes. Because we realize we have some special needs centers. We have Viewfort, we have yes. Sufre, we have Castries. I think the government of St. Lucia is moving in the right direction where we have not done what we could do, the best we could do for our children with special needs. But I can assure you that we have moved in the direction, and I hope that as we continue to look at education in the different facets, we would see the importance of also spending money in all the various aspects of education. And, and as we speak, through the efforts of, of our Prime Minister, all our special needs students are receiving $200 um, all of them. monthly. Yes, yes, so, yes. yes. I, you see, even that, while I know about it, I would have forgotten. But also, the Prime Minister went a little further, even last year, when everybody thought we had given the laptops just to yes. secondary school, the Prime Minister made sure we gave the Donata school. Yes. Because the children who are special needs children, and sometimes we think of special needs only as the children who have disabilities. Species but they are children who are special needs because they, they are not the average child and we need to cater to all our children. And that's why education must be inclusive because the, they are our children and we must take care of them. But I'm sure that it is a matter of you can see that we're moving in the direction. And I want to say, I must tell you, the people in the special needs section of the ministry, they're working on the very difficult conditions, but they're doing an, oh, an excellent job. And all the teachers who serve at Donata, at the Lady yes. Gordon, at the Sufre um, Special Needs Center, at the Viewfort Special Needs Center, yes. they are doing, I think Denry also has special needs. So I'll see all these children on Wednesday next week. I think it's next week. Yes. I will see all these children, and I'm really telling you, I look forward to these, these aspects of the education system because most times we only celebrate only the, the average so, yes. mainstream. Yes. But we must say that there are students in our special needs who we need to pay attention to also. Indeed. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Yes, good night. Um, look, um, I just heard you mention a number of schools out there. And one of the schools you mentioned is, is Viewfort Infant School. Yes. 
I mean, Dr. Lewis, do you mean we are, we are going to rebuild an infant school in that same in that same area? I mean, view what it's so large, and um, I mean to say, look at the space where that infant school is. I mean, it's almost like a prison, a very co prime commercial area. You have a bank on this side here. You have a bus terminal over there. You have a supermarket at its back. There's a bank on one side. Don't you think we could find a better location? for that infant school? Well, it, um, okay, okay, I'll wait for you, I'll wait. And the, and the second question I want, the second thing I want to ask is about the Shuzel Secondary School. Right. Oh, almost a year ago, parents, I mean, there was a lot, a lot of talk about the, the, the integrity of that school. In fact, parents have removed their children, have transferred their children because of the integrity of that school. I mean, there was talk about monies were already allocated and uh, contractors were already identified to do to repair those, this school. And up to now, we have seen nothing, we hear nothing, and among all the schools you mentioned, she was there secondary school was never mentioned. I think this will be of great, of great concern to the parents, the teachers, principals, and the students as well as that school. I don't know. I think you should give it some thought, Dr. Lee. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me say, Carla, I, I did make the point, and I was quite clear in my mind that Chazelle was one of the schools. Because I did say I could even mention all of the schools, and I agree with you. But there is a program under which Chazelle comes. And th there's a program where the various designs have been done. Now, I, I appreciate, and I am not one who is, is lost on as an educator, that there are things that take time. But this program is under a World Bank project, and it has its own place within the infrastructural um, works in our school system. So I don't think, I've spoken, the principal of the Shuzel Secondary School is a classmate of mine from Teachers College. And I mean, we've had discussion. He knows that if anything, if, if somebody were going to forget Shuzel, it won't be Robert Lewis. More so, you think Robert Lewis would forget Shuzel and Kenny Anthony would allow that to happen? I mean, I, quite honestly, there is a plan for Shuzel. I agree with you, it has taken a while because even the schools I mentioned, these schools should have been built, they should have been done as early as 2009. Mm -hmm. But notice they did not get started until, let's say, this year. So I'm telling you, while I appreciate that I have understood that, that the people, some people have taken their students out of Shuzel, I understand that. But it is not because we have been callous. It's because there's a plan program and the minister, there are different programs each of these schools fall under. And these programs will come into being, as it were, at the various times when these instruments are ready and let's say the World Bank has made them necessary monies available. I must tell you, I am worried about Chazelle, quite honestly, but I am clear in my mind that Chazelle will have works being done on it. Because I just talked about Lage and we haven't Lage on the news for the past two, three weeks. And Lage has been in the news for the last four years or more because there's need for it. And I can tell you, tell you about more schools, but I, I, choose, I choose to talk about the schools that, j just to talk about a few schools, but I am not tell, saying here that we're not going to do anything about Chuzel. All about All we're talking about is resources and there's a, pro there's a process. So I want to reassure the caller that there is consideration for Chuzel and Mr. Makarian Oishi as I said, who's my, my, my classmate from Teachers College, he knows that the Ministry of Education is thinking about that school. He's concerned about the sports, the Viewfort Infant School. Yes. He oh, says it is prime commercial uh, property. Yes. Um, I know that we invest in about um, 1.2. 1. 1. Yeah. I, I believe it's more. I believe it's no. 1.7 million dollars. I can tell you the exact amount. Go on. Yeah, I believe it is 1.7 million dollars in refurbishing this school. 1.7. Uh, 1,724,681 yes. so It's a prime minister school, so I remember. <laughs> 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 but he's asking about location. Mm -hmm. Can we or could we have not relocated the school? He says there's land available. Mm. Relocate the school and have this land available for something else. Did we look at the option of relocating the Sometimes, school? What would you know, it cost? I'll be honest with you. I, I, I inherited some of these plans. But sometimes we always make it look like schools and others shouldn't use prime property. Yeah, Why are we trying we to suggest... said the same thing for the Denry Fire yeah. Station. Why are we suggesting that our students do not deserve to be 
in, in some areas. But I understand what the caller call is saying. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think we should always say, well, the, the school actually, the school is actually protected from the traffic. Because all the students have to do is a huge playing space in front of the schools. Yeah. The students have to make their way into... And on mornings and afternoon, there is a gentleman there who's helping them cross the street. Yes, so I, 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 understand his, I understand his concerns. How long has the school been there? I mean, if all of my life well, I've known the school That school to be there. was initially built by the Roman Catholic Church. And, and definitely it's a, what you call a government-assisted school. So, I, Carla, we appreciate that, that yeah. call in terms of saying looking location. at it that way location but i can assure you that sometimes our students need to occupy prime land also i'm sure it would cost much more than we have right now to relocate well that was not when you had already discussed with the world bank what you're going to do uh, that was not one of the considerations that the ministry had entertained at the, at time. the time understood yes. good night thank you for joining us go ahead of your contribution we've lost that call good night you on the air Hi, good night, JJ. Good night, Mister. Hello, good night. good night. One question I need to ask, though, I'm concerned about the OJ Infant School, the right. Infant OJ School, Combined School, and yes. is the problem with the the stench, the farmers, the farmers. I know this, you know, it has tried to be addressed, but early through in the school term, it started again. I know it's not there now. We're in a little cold weather. Maybe we're not be able. But when the sun comes out again, yes. and it's going to start getting hot. We're going to be suffering that same fate. You know what I'm saying? What are we trying to do? What are we going to do? You know, what is the ministry's plan? Are we going to get the farmers out? Because, you know, we cannot tell how our kids coming home half day because there's a situation in that school. So, Dr. Lewis? Thank you very much, Carla. It's an issue that was raised. I think there are a few pieces of correspondence that has been sent, let's say, to the parliamentary rep, to the Ministry of Education. The, the, the issue was last addressed in 2010 by the last administration. What, the gov what, this, what this particular administration is doing, we've asked Invest in Lucia, who are the owners of the land where the farmers are using. Because a report was actually carried out that showed that if all the right steps are taken by the farmers to ensure that they do what they've been told to do, that we can have some of the establishment there and the school on the other side. But, but clearly it's but not working, Minister. Essentially, yes. For it is so not, many it's years. not working. And my take is the ministry has asked Invest in Lucia to look into the possibility of providing land somewhere else for the farmers. My understanding is that this was done under the former administration. I remember a ceremony being held um, very close to, to election time mm -hmm. by the UWP where lands were made available somewhere in the vicinity of Comfort Bay on the okay. other side um, where we actually built with okay. state resources, um, you know, facilities to house the chickens and so on. So clearly there has been a breakdown somewhere. What I intend to do, and I've been down, but I intend to go there sometime because really last week I couldn't go with all the stuff. So I intend to go down to your fault. And I think irrespective of what happens, we have to put an end to it. And I'm not, I, I don't want to make a pronouncement. Understood. And then the Ministry of Agriculture, who's also assisting with this, will, will say that, how can I preempt what they're doing? But I, I must tell you, it is a concern. And again, anything that affects the education of our children must be a concern for us. So I, I hope we can come to an amicable solution and one that will be... One that lasts. One that will be sustainable. Yes. And one that will, will help our agricultural sector as well as ensuring that our children get the quality education they deserve. Sure. We have another caller on the line. Good night. Hello, good night. Caller, can you please turn on the volume of your radio? We continue to take your calls at 452-7347. Good night. Thank you for staying in touch. Mm, good evening, Mr. Minister. Good and good evening. evening to you, Ms. Jean-Pierre. Hello. I have a concern with regards to schools, some schools in the south of the yeah, island, sure. you fought precisely. Um, there is that school at um, Compass A, Compass, you fought secondary Binfield. Mm -hmm. There are some classes with about 36 students in there to one teacher. Some of the classes have two for arm room, for arm room sponsors. I was wondering, wouldn't it be a better idea that you lessen the class and cut it down to maybe half or a little more and with one teacher? So 
by the time whoever teacher who goes to those classrooms to teach those children, they will not have that large amount, they will have a lesser amount, and the children themselves probably they will be able to concentrate a little better. And get more individual attention. Yeah. Yes. yeah okay. The one thing I can say about these issues, these are not issues that the Ministry of Education is, is the one who's supposed to do that. Quite honestly, these are, these are school internal matters. Because I'm not sure if the college say they don't have enough classrooms, because I know that's a huge school. Yes. They should have enough classrooms. I, I think, Kuala, I'm not sure from what position you're talking, but I am sure that I will bring it to the attention of the Vice Principal, Mr. Lashley, and the, the Chief Education Officer, because maybe, I, but I don't know from what position you're talking, because clearly they may have been doing that for a particular reason, and I don't know. These are internal school arrangements, but I will ask okay. a question about it. Well, you need to look into it, because I think it is just too much for one teacher. Understood. Thank, Thank you so you much for your, for your contribution. Yes. Wh what is the recommended teacher-to-student ratio? Well, the recommended ratio that you've worked with the, the union, I think, is 1 to 25. 1 to 25. Yeah, one and to so 25. clearly, in that case, we would have yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but is that something I have to look into? To look into. Yes. Sure. Our final call. Good night. You're on the air. Hi, good evening. Hello. Good night. Yeah, I'm calling you concerned about the zoning um, of the school. Sorry? In, you're calling in connection with what color? Zoning of the school. Zoning, zoning. yes. Partial zoning. So right now, we're talking about the hard economic times. Mm -hmm. You have a student from, let's say from OG. Okay, you send that child to PI Secondary School. I mean, he or she got marks to go to PI Secondary School. You have to find money for school, school friends from OG to PI Secondary. Whereas there's a Compass A and a Compass B. Binfiltory and Compass B. That child could go to that school. Well, uh, well, well, zoning. Well, how, well, how well, well Kuala, I appreciate your question. Thank you so much, Kuala. And thank you for that. Um, but you must uh, agree. Even with partial zoning, there will be children who have to travel. Because what you're saying, for you to get... I mean, if everybody could have gone into... That's why we actually created the two schools to have Viewfort Binfield Secondary and Viewfort Larissus. Because we recognize that there's a demand to have schools in the South. But you cannot accommodate all the children in the Southern Zone that there's these two schools. That's why you also have PI, you have Miku, Miku you Ange. have Ange, you, you, you have, you can go as far as Chuzel. Chuzel. Yes. So I understand the issue, and that's why the government of Senegal continues to provide some sort of transportation subsidy because that's where the, 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 the parents are supposed to try to talk with the school to see who are the children most in need of that assistance. But the partial zoning, it is not eliminated choice. No. Um, however, partial zoning does not um, limit you in the sense that there are some schools where you would have to achieve a minimum mark to go to that school. And Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School is considered one of the schools where you Viewfort need to be performing. Schools. Oh yes, you, you need to be performing at a certain yes. um, academic standard. Any plans to move into full zoning? I know that we have discussed this. We continue to look at how much money is spent in transportation. And we are realizing, too, that given the economic situation, that it is a bit difficult for the government to continue to sustain at that level. Are we going to sit out and see how it works, or are there any plans to move into a full zone? Well, I'll be honest with you, not on my watch. I said, Lucia Liberal Party is a democratic party. So you cannot eliminate choice? I, I, I don't think you want to eliminate the, the, the concept of choice altogether. I mean, quite honestly, St. Lucians have, it has to be with, and I shouldn't just say not on my watch. I should really say there has been consultation with the St. Lucian people. You have to be satisfied that if you decide to go full, zoning, whether it's at the primary level also, because it is an issue for the primary schools also, because yes. the schools in Castries are bursting at the seams, yes. while there are schools in the outer districts that have children like 15 in a class and so on, the schools in the Castries zone. And, have. and then we have people leaving some of the communities yes. where the schools aren't coming into. These are discussions. In a democracy, you always bring the issue, let the people come, they discuss it, even with corporal punishment also, this is an issue we couldn't even touch tonight. Yes, yes. These are issues you must let the people come to. And at, at, at some point, while you allow the people to make their views known, you must also look to see what is in the best interest of the country. And who knows? There might be a time where 
we will move to full zoning for both secondary for both primary and secondary but at this point quite honestly we are looking we are still working this is the second year of partial zoning we're looking at it still to see how it will change the dynamics and i'm beginning to see changes i'm beginning to see more students and i can tell you that in the grizzly corridor yes grizzly to about the you can begin to see most most students stay in that area to go to school. They don't have to cross town. I think... And I imagine it will take a little while for us to see the full benefits of... It will take about four or five years for us to begin to see the full benefits of full zone. Indeed. You noted zone. a while ago that while we have just about four more minutes on the program, I capped the calls because there's an issue yes. that I think we need to discuss. And you, you basically opened up the road for yes. me, and that is the issue of discipline in our schools. There was a situation very recently at the Clendon Mason Memorial School where a teacher was attacked. And whereas, um, you know... How the severity and so on was not known to me or to the public. It really brought me back to a time where at the Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School we had a situation. Yes. So it says to me that so many years after, discipline in schools continue to be a problem. Now, I have understood that for as long as there will be an issue of discipline in society, discipline in the home, there will be discipline in schools because the children are coming from somewhere to go to somewhere. Yes. What is the ministry's position? Or are we reviewing the systems and protocols that are in place to deal with issues of, of behavior, respect, conduct, and so on at our schools? But from a ministerial position, clearly the, the, the structures have always been in place. It is for persons to feel what the penalty of disrespecting teachers are. I, I think the ministry was clear these students have been suspended because um, I, I do not know that and, and there have been many meetings between ministry officials and the staff. I must tell you, I was at Clinton Mason and I, I, I asked a few questions and they, they were quite pleased with the, the way the chief education officer has handled it. Because I think the problem for me, and I, I've been quite candid here, the problem for me in terms of what we've seen in our schools in terms of discipline, it also has to speak, I want more of our education officers to take on their responsibilities. Because I find the chief education officer inundated with all the issues. When people take positions, they have to take positions because they want to do... You speak of the district, district education, education officers. officers. So before it gets that. to the chief, there should be a district education officer looking into it. Because the chief has to provide support. What I'm saying is, we, we realize that a lot of things were mitigating against the Penn and Mason. The, the whole idea of, of these, the facilities that they're working under, but that gives students no right to, to get to teachers. I am clear in my mind that students who disrespect teachers, the ministry should have zero tolerance for that. And parents must know that if their children disrespect teachers, they will face the full sanction that the ministry feels they should face. And I'm not one who believes that when children misbehave in schools, in the, one school, you transfer them to another school. No. I think you need to find other places where you can provide them with the same education. But I think you have to make people aware, be aware that there are consequences to their actions. And the, the Education Act is clear about a number of things. And I, I think we need to make, well, what we need to do is to educate our people a lot more of what our Education Act is, how students are going to find sanctions, what are the penalties involved. We don't want principals, we don't want teachers to abuse the authority, then we don't want parents to abuse, parents or students to abuse our teachers. Our teachers, I think teachers are the, the backbone of our education system. They're the ones who prepare our children for a life after school. And I think our students must reach the point where they realize, because there are two groups of people that I, I personally learned never to disrespect in my life. Up to a day like today, I never speak to my mother in some tones. If my mother and I are having a, a, a minor Argument, I say, Mom, I'll talk to you about it later. Yes. Because I realize I cannot the speak authority. in any kind of disrespectful tone to my mother. And I think students must learn. Parents, you must disagree with your parents sometimes, but in a respectful way. You can disagree with your teachers in a respectful way, but zero tolerance by the ministry for any child who disrespects a teacher. Minister, do you believe a suspension is enough? We take these children out of the school system for three days, for five days. Do we monitor these students? Do we counsel these students? No. What exactly is in place to deal with the problem? Because there is a problem that would lead a student to behave in that manner. 
or is this outside of the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Education? No, I, I think quite honestly there have been a number of programs and I, I can't tell you off the top of my head all the programs that are available. But even when I was a school teacher, I was at St. Mary's College, there was the police had a special program when students were taken out of school. I can recall that well. So I'm going to have, have asked about that program. When students are taken out of school, they don't spend time at home. They send to the yeah, they send to the relation branch. Yeah, the it wasn't really branch. at the main police station. But when Officer Branford was doing that, where the students spent time with them yeah. and they did their homework, they did everything. Now I think we, we now have counselors in schools, we have other outreach programs that are mm -hmm. doing different things. What I can tell you, I assure you, the next time I come here, I'll probably be able to tell you what are some of the structures we need to revamp. Because as Clement, as I've told the chief education officer and other ministerial persons, that I think we need to make sure, as you see, there are structures in place for these children. Because not just sending them home for 10 days and then they come back. There must be some sort of rehabilitation for these students who have aid. Yes, I mean, youth, youth will make mistakes. But we're saying, not because they're making mistakes, we need to tolerate yeah. anybody. We need to help them become, we need to we help need them to, become better students. Them become better we students. flip the coin now onto the side of the teacher-student relationship, where yeah. there may be instances where yes. there is abuse by the authority towards the student. Yes. Um, many persons are saying that they do not see that rapid response coming from the Ministry of Education when there are complaints by students or complaints by parents against the teachers or against the principals. Again, the systems that are in place, is there a system that would investigate how do we deal with you these know, complaints? Sometimes we say this, but I, I'll tell you, over the last few years, the Ministry has taken some swift action on teachers who have violated the rights of children. You know. Some teachers have asked to take early retirement. Some teachers have been put out of the system. I, I must tell you, I, I don't think it's fair. Every now and then we get a situation, and, rightly, and, and I admit it, that we have teachers who go over the limit. There's a call now for the abolishment of corporal, corporal punishment, punishment in schools. I think it's, it, it's something we need to look at, but we have to find, before we just decide to get rid of corporal punishment, we need to at least make sure that we have enough coping strategies for our teachers to ensure that they can respond to some of the indiscipline that our students partake in before we can do that. One of these, one of these is the child-friendly school concept that's pushed by UNICEF. And the ministry has begun with a number of schools. And I tell you, the time I'm sure, the time will come when we have enough coping measures that we may have to be in a position where we can say, well, let us not use corporal punishment. And what we want to keep telling our teachers, because they're human beings too, never discipline a child when you are angry. Always that is a golden discipline, rule for parents. Yes, for parents too. Yeah. Always discipline with one intention, not to hurt, but to rehabilitate. And I think majority of teachers, they make mistakes, yes, they do. But I think majority of teachers, when they trying to correct students, they don't want to harm them. I, I am not here trying to see, make it look like all teach, teachers are saints. They're human beings also. Yes, but, 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 I but, but we must deal with the minority deal because with the students who disrespect the teachers yes. too are in the, in the minority. A small number of students, very, yes. very small number of, of students, you know, something happens and then, you know, it blows up and it is the same thing for the teachers. You may yes. have a number of teachers all across the island who are working diligently. They are parenting our children while we send them to school. Yes. But you may have a, a, a bad seed, w verbally abuse the children, oh, you know, yes. physically abuse the children and so on. And, and parents must be satisfied that the ministry is as eager to correct that problem as yes. when students disrespect teachers. And rightly so, because we've signed on to so many conventions, the rights of a child, and, and, and we must look at these things. And I believe that we're, um, we're moving in the direction. I've seen the ministry in the last 10 years move towards that because from having everybody given that responsibility to, to use the belt, to use a cane, yes. to just the principal or if the principal designates. And I must tell you that we're moving in the direction. I see less and less corporal punishment in our schools. So yes. I hope the day will come when we'll be able to find consensus to see we can move to the next level where our children will not have to, whether it's verbal abuse or physical abuse.
Yeah, Minister, on that note, I want to thank you for being my guest on In Touch. I hope that this is the first of many appearances because there is so much that we need to discuss. I anticipate that a lot will be happening in the Ministry of Education. There are some bold pronouncements in the Senator Labour Party's blueprint for growth, one of them being the vision and hearing testing for our students yes. upon entering um, primary school so that we can identify any problems very early and provide them with remedial assistance. And so this is one of the projects that I look forward to as well. I'm hoping that as we continue to roll out the plans that were articulated in the manifesto, that at some point we will have a discussion with you as to what is happening in the priority areas and what you hope to achieve um, from now until 2016. And well, so I thank you for, for being here. Well, thank you very much, JD. I really enjoy discussing these educational issues. I think there are a lot of issues for us to talk about in our school system, and I look forward to coming back and to continuing that discussion. Sure. I want to thank our viewers. I want to thank our callers tonight. Thank you for participating and being part of a wonderful program. We have two more programs left till the end of the season. Look out for a program next week where we'll be reviewing the Senate Labour Party's three years in office. We will be presenting you some information and, of course, we'll be taking your calls so that you can speak to us as to what your views are, some of the priority areas, where do you think the government should go to next. And our final program, which is on December 8th, the Prime Minister will be here with us on our final program. And, of course, we will give you an opportunity to call in as well as we've done with all of our other shows. I rather suspect the final program will be an extended program as we come to an end of our season, a shortened season, because we started in September. Um, we go off on a break and, of course, prepare for the new year. So you have two more programs to look forward to, December 1st, um, where we review the Senate Social Labour Party's three years in office and December 8th. I want to remind all of our viewers that the Senate Social Labour Party's convention, the open, um, the open arm of our conference of delegates, is this Sunday at the Cassius Comprehensive School, so all are invited to be part of it. Of course, the report card will be presented, and the guest speaker on Sunday is uh, the Prime Minister of St. Kitts, Nevis, so you can look forward to that. We start at 3 p.m. Thank you for joining us. Please stay in touch. We'll be back here next week, Monday. Good night.